wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the world. In the world. The Chris Boss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Uh, hi, folks. It's Voss here from the Chris Voss Show.com. The Chris Voss Show.com. Hey, welcome to the big podcast. We certainly appreciate you guys tuning in. Thanks for being here. Also, uh, we've got uh, some wonderful guests on the show and everything else going on. So it should be very interesting that way. Uh, today, we have an amazing author on the show. We're going to be talking about uh, finances, money, and all sorts of. Uh, of good stuff going on that uh, should make a difference in your life. Uh, but in the meantime, share the show with your family, friends, relatives, uh, dogs, cats. Uh, you know, leave the show on when uh, you're at uh, home so the cockroaches have something to listen to. <laughs> That's an old bit. Uh, go to youtube.com, Fortress Chris Foss, goodreads.com, Fortress Chris Foss. Uh, the big LinkedIn newsletter that just kind of grows all the time and all the LinkedIn uh, stuff we do over there. Uh, the new AI podcast, check that out as well. And the leadership podcast. Uh, he is the author of the amazing new book uh, out February 3rd, 2023. Brian Kuderna is on the show with us today. He's got his new book out called What Should I Do With My Money? Economic Insights to Build Wealth Amid Chaos. And we're going to find out, should I put it in my mattress or not? No, don't do that, folks. That's bad. Uh, but we'll find out because there's a lot of things going on nowadays. There's like inflation and and uh, bank failures and uh, stock, uh, maybe depression, recession, all sorts of speculative things of where things might go. It's almost as fun as the years of COVID. <laughs> So there you go. Uh, he is on the show. He's going to be talking to us about his amazing stuff, and uh, we'll get into it there. Uh, so Brian is a certified financial planner and founder of Kuderna, uh, Kuderna Financial Team, a name one of the New Jersey's leaders in finance in 2021 by uh let's see NJ Biz. He also heard, hosts his podcast, a show about wealth. And its original meaning. Uh, Brian is also the author of the latest book, What Should I Do With My Money? And uh, we'll get into it. Welcome to the show, Brian. How are you? Hey, what's up, Chris? Thanks for having me. I am doing well, although uh, the bio we had written up for you crashed from uh, some sort of Gmail thing that's going on right now. The internet's <laughs> being really weird. We got some weird warnings from Facebook this morning, and, and everyone's getting it. It's crazy. So oh, welcome to the show. Give us the dot coms uh, that uh, people can find you at and learn more about you. Yep. Yeah, without a doubt. So uh, you can just go to Brian Kaderna, and that's Brian with a Y. So B-R-Y-A-N-K-U-D-E-R-N-A.com. That's got everything about my books, my podcast, my blog, my weekly newsletter, um, about how to stay healthy and wealthy. So that's really the, the main source for all things me. There you go. So uh, give us a reason uh, why you wrote this book. Yeah. So, I mean, the main impetus, if we look at kind of the, the timeline in 2016, I came out with a book called Millennial Millionaire. And it was mm. kind of a crash course on finance, you know, as a millennial kind of things to think about how to get off on the right foot. And so, you know, everybody was saying, hey, is there going to be a part two? Is there going to be a sequel? And then lo and behold, COVID happens. You know, we got more things than you could think of to talk about in the economy. And so I uh, ended up speaking with some big publishers, teamed up with McGraw-Hill, and uh, they just said, hey, we want you to do a book on everything. And so that's where I came up with what should I do with my money, uh, economic insights to build wealth amid chaos, and really it answers all the qu those questions of why. You know, why invest in this? What happens with taxes? Why does the government do this? Why do entitlements exist? the whole gamut you know i try and answer those questions there you go and it, it's it's uh, a it, it continues to be a crazy time uh from even what was going on the millennial things so uh tell us a little bit about your upbringing uh like uh what got you into finance what got you into the business that you're in etc cetera, et cetera. Yep. yeah so pretty wild i mean i grew up in ocean township new jersey never would have foreseen myself as a financial advisor um, you know, when I was in high school, I didn't know if college was really for me. Uh, 
you know, I thought maybe I'd go into the trades or something, just the, the normal subjects of, of geometry and biology and stuff just didn't really resonate with me. Mm-hmm. I was always a good student, but just didn't have a passion for that sort of thing. So I actually was looking at culinary schools to become a chef. There you go. Um, yeah. And then ended up pivoting and uh, I ended up getting accepted to George Mason University and thought, you know, my dad worked for the Department of Defense and the government thought maybe I'd go that route, work, you know, in the FBI or do something cool like that. 11th hour, get a scholarship from the University of Tampa, fell in love with the campus, just completely switch. Even after I got my classes from George Mason, mm-hmm. uh, go down to UT, get into business. And then, um, you know, there's a whole nother story behind all of that. But, uh, you know, I ended up changing from marketing into finance. And then it all started with an internship in 2008 and um, just wanted to be an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, it, it, everything kind of came together in a roundabout way. And, and I was able to kind of accomplish all the things I wanted to through being a financial advisor. There you go. And so how many years have you been a financial advisor now? Yep, since 08. So I guess that would be 15 years now. There you go. Congratulations, man. 15 yeah, years in any given business and, and with all the craziness that's gone on, it's, it's hard to do. In fact, uh, we wake up every day. We're on, I think in August we'll be 14 years old, the Chris Voss show. I mean, wow. we every, I, I, I can remember the early days of starting it and be like, no one's going to listen to this crap. Um, <laughs> and here you are. <laughs> and, and here we are. Uh, and, you know, back then it was so much harder to just get the internet to work with video and audio and it was crazy so uh there's a lot of things you talk about and you kind of have a unique fit with this book i think at least in my opinion where you talk about how economies and markets are affected by the way people live learn you know how they do their stuff Mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that because you know a lot of people hear oh another business book on where i should put my money i think there's kind of a unique slant that you have yeah, I think there is. And that's goes back to kind of where my passion from economics really came about. And, you know, just in college, and as I started studying and reading, I was like, man, economics just finds its way into every conversation, every debate, every decision, you know, big or small, whether it's, you know, you're deciding, hey, do we want to go out for pizza tonight? Or should we go to Ruth Chris Steakhouse? You know, there is an economic component to that decision. When we decide, you know, are we going to get some oil from Venezuela? Are we going to get it from Russia? Or do we go back and, you know, speak with Saudi Arabia about, you know, what we're importing? That's an economic decision. And Mm -hmm. so you have these micro economies that all, you know, put together, create macro economies. And it's all dictated by one of the things I reference in the book is an acronym called MICE, uh, which I actually got from a spy book on the CIA. But what MICE stands for is money ideology, compromise, and ego. And these are four motives that we all have to some extent that kind of make us who we are and and dictate, you know, how we make our decisions. And so as you take these 8 billion people, these 8 billion decision makers that make up the world, um, you know, that all these kind of uh, negotiations and compromises each day really guide economies. And it's just fascinating when you get into it. And I think as you learn more and more, you see what exactly does that mean to me and my money? There you go. And you talk about uh, a lot of the, oh God, what would you call them? Macroeconomic uh, influencers or you probably know the better word than I do, but you talk about population, entitlements, education, economic philosophy, environment, tech, war, like, you know, we're in this proxy war or whatever with uh, Russia. Uh, I didn't realize how important, you know, like rain and sunflower seeds and like all the stuff that Ukraine was giving us and how centralized it was, you know, it was one of the top three producers on some of this stuff or number one at one time. Exactly. Uh, religion. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, and I imagine that, uh, religion also affects, uh, macroeconomics. Is that what I'm looking for? Macro politics. Yeah. And economics? Yeah. Um, no, that's all right. And personal finance. Uh, and so you talk about all of these different things and how they're moving parts of this, of this whole uh, conundrum we call an economy. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And and it's funny you bring that up, Chris, because like people see the the index for the book and they're like, wait a minute, you're talking about big tech, uh, religion, entitlements, uh, you know, going green in the earth. And it's like, what, what does all this stuff have to do with my financial plan? And then what I hear from readers after they're like reading it, they're like, how could you not include that? Because 
each one of these, it may not seem that way on the surface, but as you kind of, you know, peel back the layers of that onion, you start to see like, wow, these all play together and they all dictate the way that we live, the way that we learn, the way that we teach, the way that we spend our money, you know, what's important to us. And, and that's where you have kind of this yin and yang of, you know, you might think somebody's, you know, all the way on the other side of the world. But then as you start to kind of dive into, you know, what makes the world go round, you, you know, it's really not that far away. And, and that all comes back again to economics. Yeah. And, and, and with the globalized economy that we live in, that makes all the difference in the uh, makes all the difference in the uh, uh, in how everything works, the, the moving parts, as it were. Uh, yeah. It makes it, it it's it's hard to fathom. I mean, like like I said, when the Ukraine war broke out. And I was like, well, you know, that's a crane roar in Europe. And I don't know much mm-hmm. about Ukraine. Uh, you know, I mean, no one, I don't, you know, human beings shouldn't be uh, put through that sort of horrific uh, war. Uh, and I thought we were over that kind of stuff. But uh, evidently, humans don't learn things, which is why we do the show on, with historians. Um, and, uh, but, but to realize some of the impetuses is of Ukraine not being able to export grain, sunflower seeds were like a huge thing. I was like, what? And then yeah. you find out how much, you know, you, you, at first you go like sunflower seeds. Well, you know, I can live without that for a while and <laughs> until this whole war gets worked out. Uh, and then you realize how much of that stuff goes into so many products. Like it's just, it's, it's infection. It, it, it's in, it, what's the right word I'm looking yep. for anyway. Um, but it's it, all interconnected. It, yeah. It's all interconnected. There you go. That's yep. the perfect word. And, uh, and so I like how you break this down, how you need to read this. So, you know, mm-hmm. when, when I'm looking at the markets and uh, and what's going on with, it's not just bear markets and bull markets. It's so much of like, is this company impacted by a, a single ingredient that can't be get in a certain country anymore? Uh, you know, there's a lot of talk about EVs, electronic mm-hmm. vehicles and mineral deposits. And, yep. uh, you know, the fight over them, you know, we've, we've had authors on the show that have talked about, you know, uh, China doing a lot of, uh, you know, mineral extraction and, uh, and, and controlling in Africa, which yeah. is a big yeah. thing. And then of course, you know, more and more as we need these electronic vehicles and like, we have all these electronic devices, you know, there's a need for these special minerals that are really unique. And Correct. if we don't have them, we can't make like chips and stuff. So yeah, I like how you go into all this. Yeah. And, and we do get into that in the book. You know, we talk about China and their initiative, you know, the quote unquote Silk Road 2.0, um, where essentially, you know, what they're trying to do, this master plan is to find, you know, all the different areas that have these rare, you know, minerals and earth deposits that, um, you know, are necessary to, like you mentioned, the the EVs and the semiconductors and things of that nature where, you know, ages ago we were like oh it's just a rock you know who who cares you know what's in it and now we find out you know there could be these rare earth metals that are critical uh to some of these really high tech you know products that we rely so heavily on so they're trying to kind of get ahead of the curve and say all right if we can take ownership of them or collaborate you know also and often with these emerging market countries and help them and do the financing and build economies there um, but essentially be their only customer, that that's a way that they could dominate the market. And, and mm-hmm. it's, uh, you know, it's somewhat scary because it's like, well, if, if all of that came to fruition, I mean, they could kind of push us to the side and say, all right, you know, if you want these products, you need to come to us. Uh, and that's what you're seeing right now, in a sense, with both America and China being so dependent on Taiwan for semiconductors and microchips. Um, so if if they could do that on a much, much bigger scale, that would give them, again, a very big economic competitive advantage. Now, it's not really going as planned so far. Uh, and the other thing I talk a lot about in the book, too, for, for the doomsday people that are like, oh, my gosh, what's going to happen to America? You got to think about it. Right now, there are two superpowers. There's the U.S. and there's China. We have the biggest economy in the world, and they're number two, but they have been gaining on us. However... Our biggest customer outside of, you know, outside of d- domestic America is China. And China's biggest customer outside of China is America. <laughs> so it would behoove the two of us, as much as we may disagree on certain things, to say we need each other and our people are infatuated with what we can do for each other. 
So there's no way to decouple these two economies. Um, so I think that that is kind of the silver lining when people say, oh, there's a big disagreement. You know, China's military is advancing. You know, it's so scary. You know, it would not benefit them at all to come to a strong disagreement with us. And uh, conversely, it wouldn't benefit us to do that with them. So Yeah. And, and what do you think, you know, one of the things you're talking about in your book is population. You know, yeah. the I've heard for, I think it's 20 years now, the rising of China and billionaires and, and multimillionaires and globalists have been sending, you know, their, their sons and daughters to uh, either go to China or learn Mandarin because you know, the newest, biggest market is going to take over. You know, for years, our, 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 our strength was being the largest market in the world. And yeah. so, you know, everybody feigned to our ability to buy and have power and, of course, the U.S. dollar. And yeah. then with the prediction was by, I think it was 2025, that uh, uh, China was going to merge and be the dominant market and we were going to be a, a, a fading empire. We may still be, whether and there's a lot of different indicators of that. Yeah. But uh, what's happened that's kind of interesting to me is, is, you know, China was faking, I think, for at least 10 to 15 years its GDP by building stuff they didn't need to be building. And mm -hmm. uh, and that was creating a bubble for them. And then on top sure. of that, the one-child policy uh, yeah. created a bubble for them as well. They now have, like, I think it's a three-to-one ratio of eligible men to eligible women. <laughs> um, they actually have these weddings where they, or not these, they have these huge convention events where they actually bid out the wives the potential wives and, wow. and and they have so many men and they can't mate and they can't have children so they're actually uh they've actually broken a decline as a declining mm -hmm. population and it looks like they're going to go kind of japanish if you're familiar with what's going on there where the sure. the you new younger generation can't support the older generation exactly yep in retirement and everything else we saw that in england uh, after 2008 crashes where they had to kind of go after pensions yeah and then china india just recently emerged as the largest fastest growing uh population in the world bigger yeah. than china and of course bigger than us and yeah. so it's kind of interesting and so i like how you talk about these dynamics and people need to understand them when they make their investments and what they're investing sure. in well, exactly because at the end of the day you're investing in people you know and mm -hmm. it may not always seem like it when you go buy apple or microsoft or facebook or nike or whatever but they're all just service and services and products for people at the end of the day and so that's why the whole book starts with chapter one is population. <clears throat> and there's a lot of things we can talk on that if you want. But, you know, the fact of the matter is our earth is not growing at all. All right. It's been the same size for millennia. But if you look at population growth, the numbers, the charts I put in there are just eye opening of how wow. it took thousands and thousands of years to reach a billion people. Then mm -hmm. it just took another hundred years to reach two billion people, you know, in, at the turn of the 20th century. And then, you know, we fast forward to where we are now in 2023 with eight billion people. Wow. You know, these are all people that we need to care for. There's mm -hmm. givers and there's takers. There's people that are giving to the economy and then one's taking from it. And like you alluded to, you know, we're, we're in a shift right now with the baby boomers where, you know, these entitlements that have become kind of the bedrock of the American economy are really under pressure. And so it's like, are we going to keep them all solvent for these baby boomers? And are we going to ask, you know, Gen Z and millennials to really step it up and, and you know, be able to fund these programs? Or what are we going to do? And that same kind of conundrum, like you mentioned, is really unfolding in Japan in a bad way. And China is kind of like us when you look at like the aging demographics, but just much, much bigger than us. And so we're all right there. So uh, do you have any outlooks for what we're, what cycle we're in? Uh, we were talking before the show in the green room that uh, the, they just came out with the uh, new sort of uh, what's going on with inflation. Uh, I believe it's fallen down to 4.9%, which is still above the fed feds projected rate that they want to hit to balance the economy. Uh, we've seen, you know, a, a staggering amount of, very late, in my opinion, I think a lot of economists agree with me, very late that uh, the Federal Reserve came to the rescue of uh, finding inflation. But, you know, I mean, 
you, uh, dealing with COVID and uh, was it like eight trillion they floated during COVID? Was it eight or twelve trillion they floated or yeah. f- funded in the economy? Um, you know, it's we're in a game that no one's played before. In fact, what's even weirder about this time that I think is interesting, and correct me if I'm wrong, please, because mm-hmm. you're the pro. Um, you know, uh, we're in a weird kind of quote unquote recession where we have, you know, this incredible amount of surge of demand for employees. We have all these companies laying off and we, and we have, you know, projected, uh, everything's going to go to hell, but we have this surge of top paid, you know, highly paid employees that are in demand. And I know Mm -hmm. one of the problems of that future, to my understanding is a lot of the baby boomers and late gen Xers left the economy and retired early. It just said, fuck it, we're out with COVID. <laughs> and so there's actually a glut of of employees. And so yeah. it's a really weird recession. I mean, I own a mortgage company for 20 years. I used to sit and live and die on Greenspan's thing with millions of dollars in my portfolio. Yeah, uh, You know, that guy could ruin my day. Uh, I could lose $400,000 overnight with that dude. Yeah. Um, and so I had to know what he was doing and how he was doing it and call the ball. But yeah. uh what do you see now with what's going on with this current state that we're in? Yeah. And and it's interesting because like a lot of people have asked me that same question you're saying of like, are we in a recession? Were we in one? Are we going into one? And so the reason that that technically we haven't actually been in a real recession yet is the way they define it in generic terms is, you know, two consecutive quarters, negative GDP growth, which we did realize in 2022. Yeah. So some could say we had a recession. However, the other big metric is unemployment and the unemployment number has been, you know, from an economic standpoint, awesome. All right. It's Mm -hmm. been very, very low all throughout. So like you said, strong labor market, but a lot of other things looking a little bit wacky. So like what gives here? And I think, you know, and like you mentioned, it's so easy to get frustrated with like, how did the Fed not see this coming? Like, how are you telling me inflation was transitory? When the government just was like blowing trillions of dollars, like it was absolutely nothing. Um, and, I mean, it was almost like becoming comical. So it's like you had to know that inflation was on the way. But I understand it is easy to to kind of Monday morning quarterback this. We were off the heels of just a historic pandemic. So nevertheless, I, they were late to the game. They should have been in it in 2021. They weren't. Inflation got much worse. And so I think you know, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell kind of said like, all right, you think I was late to the game? You think I don't have the guts to to play this and raise rates that he just kind of let the dogs loose last year? And I think that's why those rate hikes were so aggressive yeah. and continuing where a lot of people said, hey, you know, you let the dogs loose. Let's see how it affects the economy now. It, you know, it could be 12 to 18 months for interest rate adjustments to matriculate through the economy. So let's let this unfold a bit where instead he said, no, we're going to keep the pedal to the floor right into 2023. And, uh, you know, here we are. Like you said, you know, fortunately, inflation has been coming down. We saw this morning it's 4.9% year over year, uh, Mm -hmm. which is the slowest in over two years. So that's a good thing. Um, So you're probably going to see a pause now. uh, And now it's kind of like, did they negotiate that landing perfectly where we're going to get that soft landing? Or did they go a little too far and we could see some volatility now in the markets? Uh, There's just so much. So you have that to deal with. And then meanwhile, it's almost like that's yesterday's news. Now we're on to are we going to hit the debt ceiling? And, you know, there's always something new that we're dealing with. And and that's why as a financial advisor, I'm always telling clients, you know, keep your eye on the ball. Keep a long term vision. And do not get emotional because every night you turn on the news, there's plenty to freak out about. There you go. Uh, What do you think about these bank failures? Now, my understanding is, uh, you know, this has a lot to do with the rate increases, but also has to do with a lot of uh, banks holding uh, commercial real estate. One of the problems that is going on in San Francisco, and San Francisco gets a lot of bashing for stuff, but people don't understand, I think, what's going on 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 the ground. And 30, I think it's a little bit more than 30% of downtown San Francisco is empty and vacant. And it's not because of, you know, people throw all sorts of political crap at it because they, I don't know, they listen to memes and they have no idea what's going on. But on the ground, 
COVID basically drove people from office buildings and they haven't returned. Mm -hmm. And so they're literally sitting on 30% of the, uh, of the office buildings in San Francisco that are empty and people just aren't coming back. And, and there's a lot of real estate around the country that's held that way. And a lot of that is bank held by yep. banks. And yep. we're seeing these uh, massive bank failures. In fact, it's kind of quieted on the news, but they're still happening. Yeah. And, uh, uh, part of it is part of, to my understanding is, is there's a lot of trillion dollars in debt that are not trillion dollars in debt, trillion dollars, trillions of dollars in cash that have been removed from the system. Like people are starting to hoard, uh, yeah. the first Republic thing, a hundred billion dollars, uh, on a bank run that people did yeah. on the bank to withdraw stuff once it looked like it was scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's kind of interesting what's happening with that. On the meantime, you've had uh, the used market, I know, is crashing. The used car market is crashing. Uh, so that's interesting. And that's kind of the intent of what the Fed does. But it's really crashing hard because it was really to an extreme. But on, then on the flip side, I saw a thing that um, uh, sales of homes are up. But then you have yeah. people like, I think it's like BlackRock who are like hoarding homes. And so it's really, I mean, it's, the dynamics of this market are crazy. Yeah. And, and there's so many things there, Chris, that you, you just touched on. I could do uh, an episode on each one of them. No, we, we could be here for, for hours. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, it's just it's just the speed in which our economy moves today. It, it, mm. We're at breakneck speed in the transfer of information, the transfer of wealth and money. Uh, so, you know, it, it's a great thing. You know, when things are going good, we can expand our economy very quickly. That's awesome. But when things go bad, it can get out of control sometimes before we can get our hands around it. That's what you saw with the banks. That's the only way that a bank run happens is when too many people too quickly get emotional and say, oh, my gosh, what if something goes on here? Get your money out. That's what happened to, you know, Silicon Valley Bank. Mm -hmm. They were the first one. Um, I read the uh, the Federal Reserve came out with their bank report a couple weeks ago on that, or the the autopsy report they call it. And you know there were a few things there. It, they were unique in that they were so concentrated in their depositor base uh, with you know startups, venture capital, and tech that it was kind of like you just invite like a little click to your party, and if they say you know what I don't think that party's going to be so hot. If they leave, all well, the party's over. There's nobody there. That's what happened to Silicon Valley Bank because on social media and through a couple emails with their, their biggest customers, it spread like wildfire that they weren't in the best shape. And then it was an overreaction that caused the bank run. Mm -hmm. Having said that, you know they weren't well capitalized. That could have been a lot better because there was deregulation around the banking system You know, during COVID. That's a whole other thing we could talk about. And then the other thing is they didn't manage their interest rate risk too well. Um, so it's kind of like this little bit of a perfect storm, you know, that caused that. And then there was a trickle, you know, to uh, Signature and then to First Republic. But uh, the thing I always tell people is it's like when they went to, to uh, Silicon Valley Bank and they said, you know, I want to take out my $20 million deposit. They didn't take that out and just light it on fire. They took it out and they moved it to another bank. OK, so it's still in the economy and some of that may get invested and so forth, but it didn't disappear. And I think that's important to recognize. And that's how, you know, J.P. Morgan was able to go buy First Republic is, you know, I think you're going to see a system in which the very big, very well capitalized banks are going to have to pitch in to help out their their smaller, you know, the minor leagues, the regional banks. And then the government's also always got to be there as a backstop, which they have been. So the depositors were kind of okay, knock on wood so far, but the investors and some of the employees of those banks, that's where you got to be kind of careful in how these companies are being run. There you go. Uh, you know, it was, it was interesting to me how much money the Fed – uh, can you call it printed? And I believe it was the tune of eight or $12 trillion over COVID. Uh, and it was initially, as soon as things started hitting, I think they spent $8 trillion, um, mm -hmm. to to balance the economy and take on a treasury debt. Um, yep. I think it was. And so don't quote me on these figures, folks. So go do your own research. But something like that. And uh, yep. uh, they were floating the economy. I'm reading something from March of 2021 from NASDAQ.com. Uh, mm -hmm. we try and stick with the, 
legitimate websites uh and and it quotes is all the all the the all-in money printing total 13 trillion dollars as of this was uh in uh what i say march of 2021 so there's been more of that since um but yeah it was do we just get drunk on all the government you know the government gave everyone a lot of covid money and so that was kind of floating a lot of households and economies and people were spending it like crazy they were just having a ball with it consumer confidence took a dip initially but came back it's still quite high considering everything that's going on it's it's nowhere near what happened in 2008 um do do we just get drunk on like all this money we flood in the system to get through covid that's it's a good way to put it i think just the simple answer is yeah we did and uh you know there's a saying sometimes you hear thrown around that no good politician you know lets a crisis go to waste and (laughs) and it's there you had a lot of that going on too because think about it. I mean, was it all warranted? Yes. From a conceptual standpoint, we had this unknown pandemic we were dealing with, with tremendous loss of life, impact on the economy, closing our restaurants, our hotels, all, you know, all this stuff. So we were in a pickle. We needed an emergency bridge loan of sorts to say, we got to get from A to B and we don't know how long this chasm is that we're going to have to cross. Having said that, and imagine a scenario, Chris, where I said, all right, we're going to just print trillions of dollars to give to everybody. Every Everybody just come grab some. Mm-hmm. Borrowing is going to be free. You want a loan, you want a program or anything, have it 0%, no real underwriting. It's there for you. And mm-hmm. oh, by the way, you don't have to work right now. And we're going to give you money for that too. So you don't have to work. That's not an economy. And we did that for like over a year. Uh-huh. And so when you think about that with something so big as the U.S. economy, you know, the the repercussions to that are we still haven't realized them all yet. Uh, so it's it was unfortunate that it went so far. But, you know, the the opponent to that, you know, argument or that debate would say, well, what if we didn't? What if we didn't do those things? I mean, yeah. could we have gone into the Great Depression? Yeah, and, and it's possible. So in a perfect world, we look backwards and say, well, you know, we should have had a balance, you know, but, you know, nevertheless, here we are and we spent a hell of a lot of money. <laughs> it's hard to balance an economy. I mean, like I say, I've gone through a lot with the Federal Reserve and, and Alan Greenspan days, and I used to have to sit and try and figure out if he was going to do a quarter point or a half point. And, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's hard. You, you just can't get an even keel, especially with the global economy. You know, no one predicted after COVID, you know, war breakout with Russia and Ukraine. And so, so you talk about a lot of these factors in the book, which I think are important and uh, all that good stuff and, and how to make sure that you understand. So when I'm looking at a company or stock, do I need to apply all these different uh, metrics that you have in the book to it? Do I need to say, is GE going to be impacted by, you know, global wars and, and populations and people buying washers and dryers you know there's kind of so there's a weird thing going on now i don't even fully understand it so i'm not going to comment on it but you know there's a weird thing going now where new york is banning gas stoves i mean i, I if i'm investing in ge and i don't know if ge still does gas stoves but i imagine i think they are you know or whatever gas stove company you know what, yep. what's the impact going to be in their stock price et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, you do. I mean, that's that's kind of the the truest answer of it is, you know, all these things play together. And so when you're looking at an investment and you're weighing kind of the fundamentals versus the technicals, you know, you can get into all the what's the price of the stock trading at right now? What's the price to earnings ratio, the book to value ratio? You can get into all these things that they all look just like math, but they all tell a story as well. If you kind of dive under the hood and see how the company is performing. So that's important. But from a fundamental standpoint and from uh, what's going on in the global economy, you know, I often say there's like that cool factor, you know, mm-hmm. it can can a company, you know, do well. Are they are they cool? Is it something that people are going to want to use their product or service and it's going to spread like wildfire, like an Instagram or a TikTok or, or one of these or an iPhone just because we like it? You know, there's a value to that that maybe isn't always apparent on paper initially. And so you, you have to kind of recognize these things. And there's there's a story to every one of them. You know, a lot of uh, clients and friends of mine have invested in properties that they said, oh, I'll do Airbnb. 
you know, I, I love it. And they then go make an investment with that intent. And then lo and behold, the municipality it's in says, oh, we're banning short-term rentals. It got too crazy. And it's like, wow, I just, I made a monster investment in this beach house. And now all of a sudden you kind of change the rules of the game. Yeah. That's that's all economics there. And that's where the book, you know, hits on so many of these different competing points. Yeah, I saw that with a lot of Airbnb people. It almost like the market got saturated. Um, yeah. And uh, and then, of course, I, you know, Airbnb, I think, changed some of their policies. And then, uh, like you say, cities went after it. When I was uh, in Las Vegas a few years back, they started really banning it hard because the, the, you know, the hotels were not happy about losing business. Uh, the HOAs and people in neighborhoods were tired of, you know, houses turning into party homes. And if you're familiar with the way party people party in Vegas, especially young people, <laughs> they're not very kind to the place they yeah, party. I, in. Yeah. I had friends who had multi-million dollar uh, uh, units in Turnberry, I think it was in Vegas, and uh, they got trashed. And they're like, we didn't understand that they would party this hard. And I'm like, have you been to Vegas? Yeah. <laughs> But uh, yeah, a lot, lots of things. What do you think about gold? Gold uh, right now is pretty much almost or just short of its all-time high, which it hit, uh, I think, in 2020. And it, yeah. it seems like it's still raging onward. That's usually a safe haven a lot of people go to for pending recessions, depressions, call it what you will. Yeah. Yeah. So and one thing I, I just wanted to kind of close out on the point you were making before and and I, I have a, a chapter in my book called Economic Philosophy that just compares socialism and capitalism. Mm -hmm. And a, a lot of the things that you were just kind of describing are the result of a capitalist economy. Mm -hmm. We want a free economy, but then if there's not constraints, you know, certain parts of it can kind of get a little bit haywire. Mm -hmm. So then you have on the other side of the, the pond, if you will, all the way in China, you know, that's considered our socialist counterpart. But they will be the first to tell you that socialism, you know, isn't really working and they're, you know, everything that worked for them, that expansive growth that they had was through capitalism, which now they're branding as state run capitalism. So they're saying, you know, we want all the benefits of economic freedom and of capitalism, but we're going to control it. And so now it's kind of like you're talking out of both sides of your mouth there. And I think they're in a real kind of tipping point of like, can they then take control of what capitalism gave it or are they just going to kind of reverse course as, as communists and uh you know upset the boat there or upset the apple cart so yeah. a lot of interesting things when you get into kind of the socialism capitalism conversation do you talk about generational because one thing that is interesting you brought up the socialism thing it's very interesting to see this new gen z uh you know the participation trophy generation uh, who loves having everything handed them for free uh I, I mean that's just it really um you know they they seem to want this socialism thing i think studies have shown and polls have shown with them that they're more supportive of socialism over over uh, capitalism than anything ever before i mean yep. that's a, that's another economic factor of, uh, of people's huge. spread and that's that was a huge part of the book of, you know, what I want to do. I'm not telling people pick capitalism, pick socialism. I'm just trying to educate. Here's exactly what the two are. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think it was Thomas Jefferson said, you know, not every difference of uh, opin opinion is a difference in principle. And it's because sometimes we don't understand really what the two are and how they actually operate and what the consequences are. So I tried to really just put some of the history there in the book. Um and it's true. I mean, you're seeing young people lean more socialist than ever. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's that goes against kind of the fabric of Americana. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's really kind of like a, a testing point. But on the flip side, you know, th these younger generations identify more than ever as wanting to be entrepreneurs, which it's always funny to me. <laughs> I'm like, you tell me you're a socialist, but you want to be an entrepreneur. That's like you telling me, you know, I'm a vegetarian, but, you know, I want to go to Five Guys tonight for a burger. It, it, it yeah. like doesn't totally add up. Um, so I think there's a, a bit of a disconnect there, too. And if we can just kind of, uh, you know, get get some information out there and not be so married to our ideas and, and willing to kind of, you know, be open minded um, that, you know, you'll see we're a mixed economy. You know, we're, we're not purely capitalist. We're not purely socialist. We're what works, which is a little bit of both. 
And I, I think just people need to come to grips with that and not be so, you know, I pledge allegiance to this one side and I will never, ever move against it. Because once you stake a belief in it, then it, it's very hard to, to improve. Yeah, I think people default in ignorance to a black and white sort of model. They're like, uh, capitalism sucks. Yeah. You know, they yeah. see billionaires and people, uh, you know, buying SCOTUS judges and other things going on. And like, yeah. uh, capitalism sucks. We're an oligarchy, which we kind of are, actually. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, and then on the other hand, they're like, you know, we want socialism because we really like handouts because working's hard, eh? Um, and, and there are things that are going on with that generation that they have a real problem. They can't afford houses, houses, you know, we just went through this extreme inflation, so they can't afford houses, they can't afford cars. I'm watching a interesting TikTok channel where there's a, a very young accountant like you, uh, and he uh, goes through people's finances and they're all gen like Z people and probably late, late, late gen, uh, the, the late curve of the millennials, but uh, it seems like they're all Gen Zers and uh, maybe some of the, the late bit of the years of a millennial, but he's going through their finances and he's, he kind of excoriates them a little savagely, but he's, he's, it's not, it's, it, it's a bit of a beat up, but it's also like, Hey man, he's trying to shake these people. You can tell they're in denial about their expenses. And I mean, these guys are paying like $1,500 a month for, for uh, cars you know that they can't afford they're making like thirty thousand dollars a year or something and he's like hey man you you can't afford rent and you're running up credit cards and you know and it's really an interesting thing to watch his yeah video, his tiktok channel and uh and and he's really raw with these people and, and he has to be because they aren't getting it yeah. and you know, and he's like, he's like, you make thirty thousand dollars a year, and you're ordering all your food three times a day off of, uh, off of uh, Grubhub. You know, yeah. <laughs> it's like, you know, every now and then I'll have, uh, I have, uh, who is it? It's the, it's the, it's the hero place. They make the sandwiches. Uh, yeah. Jimmy John's. I, okay. I should get paid for this plug. Jimmy John's, if you're out there, you owe me money. Um, but I'll have Jimmy John's deliver for me. And it, can, it gets to be extraordinary. It's like, I think an extra five or seven bucks between the tip, because I tip well, yeah. um, and the delivery fee. But even then, like, sometimes I've gone on Domino's, and I know I shouldn't eat Domino's, but I'll go on Domino's, and I'll see the between the delivery fee and the tip, and I just go, you know what? I don't need it. I don't need the fat. Fuck it. But I can't. Yeah. I never have ordered off a of Grubhub. Like, 40 bucks or something for delivery for some food? Yeah. I just cannot cross that line as a Gen Xer. I mean, maybe I'm a, a miserly old man, but I don't care how rich <laughs> I am. I'm not paying, you know, for a $10 meal, 40 bucks for a $10 meal. It's not happening. But he interviews these people that are making like 30 grand a year and there's they're living on Grubhub three times a day. Yeah, it's and that's so much of what I talk about, Chris, is like you, you, this need for both financial responsibility and also financial literacy, because yeah. um, I think some people throw their hands up in there. They're like, man, I got student loans. You know, college mm -hmm. has cost me a fortune. I haven't found the job that I love yet. These houses now are unaffordable. Like, screw it. I'll just go get Grubhub every week because whatever. And 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 it's unfortunate to kind of see that. So that's really my message to people is like, it's not insurmountable. We might just have to work a little bit harder or get a little bit more creative. Um, but you're either going to be a part of the economy and thrive or you're going to quit. And, and when you quit, the success rate is 0%. So it's like, yeah. why? We're not going that way. You can't. And we can't make that okay through the participation trophy, like you mentioned. We've got to, you know, kind of get back to reality of like, if you do not want to work and you don't want to be a part of this economy, then you can't enjoy all the benefits of this economy. Yeah. And uh, that's a whole other thing I could get into as well. <laughs> yeah. I mean, so I'm teasing out a lot of stuff because we want people to go pick up the book. Yeah. yeah you yeah. know, the Gen X thing or the Gen Z thing is very real. You know, they're not making families like we used to. They're not starting families early on like we used to. Families yeah. are a building block to the to the US, any economy in the world in taxation yeah. base. Families are an economy. You know, I've always joked that the reason, you know, I'm single, no kids, I, I couldn't afford the millions of dollars in divorce attorney fees, so I never got married. Um, <laughs> that's actually less of a joke than it is true. Um, and uh, if I said that right, 
and 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 so these these kids can't get married and uh, being able to reproduce and expand the population is a tax-based thing and so i always used to tell the joke to people i'm like the reason you guys pay less taxes than i do because and you get all those write-offs for dependents is because you're breeding taxpayers future taxpayers (laughs) for the government you're expanding the economy yeah and uh that that belies the future of empires and 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 economies if you understand it you see what's going on in japan where the new generation can't support the old generation and they're an empire in collapse uh and not a good outlook really when it comes down to it so um so we we're facing that now with the gen z and if they can't afford yeah. cars and and houses you know men are not, men are the gatekeepers to marriage they're not going to make families they're not making families they're not mating yeah. actually for a lot of other reasons mm-hmm. um and and we need those families and kids to breed and build the economy and yep. instead we're going to have a population decline which everything yep. gets sucked into the void and yeah. so Lots of different moving parts. There, are, there are. There's a them. lot. And so, and that's why I love, and, and you'll see a lot in, in my book, you know, there's a lot of references to history, um, a mm-hmm. lot of history lessons in there because no empire has withstood the test of time. You know, that every empire, you know, it, it kind of has this big climb to glory. And then for a period of time, it sustains itself as kind of like the, the superpower of the world. And then it starts to kind of go by the way the dinosaur or kind of evolve into a different sort of empire. Um, so, you know, it kind of sounds silly almost like talking about that now in 2023, but it's the reality of it. And I think, you know, a lot of these population dynamics are things that we're going to have to live through. And what makes it tough in our system is being this two party system of Republicans and Democrats, and we've got to vote for somebody. And so that person getting elected has to go out and get all those votes. It's like, all right, well, let me go look at my audience here. If over on the right, I've got older folks that are like, you better keep my social security. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, long-term care is getting expensive as hell. You know, is my Medicaid going to be there? My Medicare going to be there? And then you got young people just like, I can't afford a house because my student loans are a noose on my neck. As As the politician, you're just trying to get elected. You're like, all right, how do I appeal to both of them when they're on two polar sides of the spectrum and they're both asking for help. And, and so it's, it's a tough thing to kind of navigate. And, uh, I'll tell you what, the, the one thing, and I talk in the book about this too, that has been our strength, kind of our secret sauce for America has been immigration. We have always been the land of the free. We've always welcomed people. And frankly, for like a lot of the 1900s and and 1800s, even in the later part of the century, we were frankly a brain drain on the world. When we said, let's take the the wealthiest, the brightest, the smartest, the hardest working and put them in this place called America that has tons of resources and just watch it go crazy. And it's been a beautiful thing to see unfold. And I think that's something that we always got to keep our eyes on and uh, make sure that we can allow people who who want American ideals and principles and are ready to work for them to have a pathway for them. And they can't get crowded out by some of, you know, some of the bad things that maybe are already going on here or other people that are saying, oh, screw that. I'll just come into the country and do whatever I want and, and make that OK. So it, we have to keep that immigration system very strong because that's what's been able to plug the gaps for us and and we need it more so now than ever with the economy with the population collapse that i talked about you know sure. we had uh, I, I forget the name of the gentleman but we had him on he wrote the book uh, one billion americans i think it was called and it was a case study for why we need to expand immigration why we need more people in this country to compete with you know china uh india becoming larger markets people understand this that dynamic and that's like you said that's what made our country great i mean the reason we have the nuclear bomb first was because we took uh oppenheimer and a lot of these guys from i think i don't know if Oppenheimer was from germany but we took a lot of the 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 great rocket people that uh hitler sadly had and brought them here and utilized them and and they built our NASA program and rockets and yeah. and the nuclear bomb. Those were all the scientists that came, and we need that. I mean, Steve Jobs was an immigrant. Uh, his father was an immigrant to this country, I think, from Syria. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Elon Musk. I mean, the list goes Elon on Musk. and on yeah. and on. The you, CEO of Google right now. 
Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so, but that's the key is like, if we can get those, then America will keep getting kind of that shot in the arm to, yeah. to be all that it is. Um, so that's, that's a part of it is like, we want productive people. We want good people. Of course we want to take care of everyone we can. Um, but you know, we can't have, and not only do we just want like a ton of people here, there's gotta be a strong balance of that givers and takers, as I call it in the book. Yeah. Um, you know, always tilted a little bit more towards givers that are really productive people in the economy uh, that are innovators, because if we expand our population size by just adding people that are leeching off of the system, then it goes the other direction where we're starting yeah. to drown ourselves even quicker. Uh, well, there's a lot so. of misnomers about immigrants and how they come in the system and whether they're vetted or not. And there's a lot of political people who take advantage of that and, of and course, are fear-mongering yeah. and, of course, funded by, you know, uh, a lot of uh, billionaires that uh, slant that way. Um, and, and, you know, what? what's interesting to me, because that surge is, there's a surge of immigrants coming now, you know, now that kind of COVID's over and I think Title 42 is relaxing. Mm -hmm. um, and... It's interesting to me that Americans, uh, some Americans are like, well, we can't have more immigrants coming to the country because they'll take our jobs. And they don't understand that, like I mentioned earlier in the show, the, the boomers and, and late Gen Xers like me retired early and they left the market. And we knew that when they left the market, I've been hearing about this for 40 years, that when these people left the market, we were going to have this upside down glut. And they mm -hmm. left the market early or COVID. And, you know, you've got people like, I don't want to have to pay you know, five, four to five dollars for eggs. And you're like, well, somebody's got to pick those eggs, right? <laughs> and Americans don't want to pick. I last time I checked, American children are like, yeah, I'm not doing farm work. Uh, no. So, yeah. you know, we need to fill the glut that's been lost from that thing. And we need to expand our economy into a population. If we've got a declining one from, you know, all the, all the stuff we've talked about on the show, we've yeah. got thrown in. So uh, let's round up the show. Anything you more you want to tease yeah. out on the book before we go? Yeah. And I'm sorry, I didn't get to kind of the, the gold conversation, which uh, I, I won't impart advice on that. I mean, gold sometimes can be a safe haven. I just want to acknowledge the, the question, but if you do look at like, let's say 2011 to 2020, you know, it didn't really move at all. So that's mm -hmm. where it's, does it have a place? Sure. But I don't think it's something that you, you, be, you know, put the bank on. It's just one asset class in a portfolio. Yeah. It may um, be very well peaked out from, from what I've seen. It, it is at its highest marks, which is usually, yeah, I don't know. It can always go higher. I, I mean, I come from uh, trading uh, being a stockbroker trained uh, yeah. trader and doing day trades where, uh, I remember back in the day, there, there was like two rules. Gold will never break 800 and uh, price earnings ratios should never break 15. That's like, that was like the high point if it broke 15. You're like, oh, yeah. PE ratios over 15, sell. And uh, <laughs> yeah, the dot-com era broke that. Yeah, and then there was Amazon and Google and on and on. Um, <laughs> Which I made a lot of money on. Sure. Yeah, it, but in regards to the book, um, you know, I'm glad we were able to spend some time on it. Again, it's called What Should I Do With My Money? Economic Insights to Build Wealth Amid Chaos. I think it's really, it's educational, but also entertaining. And where we start with the population, we go through the biggest factors in our economy today, entitlements, education, environment, tech, religion, you'll see really finds its way in there with ideologies, all these different economies. Uh, and then talking about war too. And fold it all together and then a nice little financial plan at the end of the book. So, uh, you know, please go out, check it out. I'll hold up a quick copy here. It's this nice gold book. And each chapter has economic insights, which are these really cool stories, real stories about people and icons and business and history that, you know, capitalized when things seem like, you know, there's, there's no room here or this isn't fair. And then lo and behold, a new invention or a new turn in the economy so we're going to continue to see those. So I think that's what's exciting. That's where the opportunities lie. Uh, but you got to be educated. You got to be in the know. And that's what I tried to do. And whatever this is, uh, I don't know, 250 pages and under, you can kind of get all of that. There you go. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show. It's been very insightful and a great, uh, a great uh, discussion of just uh, we covered like a lot of things. We just boom, 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 boom. But, but these are these are things that impact you. I mean, we're next month. We're we, you know there's argument now with the politicians over 
over uh, the budget thing. And if they, they default, you know, that's a whole new crisis. Uh, it's interesting to me. And I, I think if I can do one PSA, it, it, we need to start demanding from politicians that they do stuff that are kitchen table things. Quit getting lost in all their stupid stuff, you know, yeah. about, you know, their, all their little things they hit to fire up people. Get them to fix infrastructure. Get them to fix the taxes. Get them to fix prescription health care. Get them to fix stuff. Quit getting, you know, they're using all the all those sort of things. Oh, immigrants over here, or, you know, this thing over here, whatever the thing is, get them to stop yeah. doing that. Stop paying attention and giving it action. D demand them fix the kitchen table stuff. Fix I agree. The of yeah, the it's like uh, stop worrying so much about special interests and worry about general interests. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what can help people. Kitchen table politics. Um, like so... Thank you very much for coming on the show. We got your dot com in there, didn't we, Brian, with uh, the book? Yep. Yeah. Brian Kaderna dot com. And uh, you can follow me social media, B Kaderna on Instagram, Twitter and the like. And, um, you know, definitely uh, sign up for my newsletter. Check it out. Weekly Wealthy Wisdoms. And, and you got the podcast as well, too. Yeah. The Kaderna podcast. And I always say we define wealth in its original meaning, a state of well-being. Uh, so check that out. I'm sure you guys will like that, too. There you go. Uh, order it up, folks. Where refined books are sold. What should I do with my money? Economic insights to build wealth amid chaos. Don't put it in your mattress, people. Uh, there you go. Read the book and you'll have a better understanding of how to invest your money and what to do with it and how to stay safe. At least, uh, you know, it's the world. You know, it's I don't think anything's ever fully 100 percent safe. Maybe my mattress is. No, it's not. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Be good at your Stay safe. And we'll see you guys next time. That show is out. Great show, Brian. Awesome.